Born by the name Marvel in the year 1914, Jack Parsons was delivered into the hands of a very well-off family living in a prestigious community in Los Angeles, California. His mother Ruth was the daughter of a wealthy businessman who owned two companies, including a successful automobile corporation in Springfield, Illinois. And it was there that Ruth met Marvel H. Parsons, the man who would become Jack's father. Uh, this inherited wealth afforded a high-class lifestyle for the Parsons family. Jack was a single child who was free to pursue his every whim and pampered by the services of butlers and housemaids and tutors and spoiled to no end. Uh, his parents sadly ended up separating when Jack was still pretty young. His father, Marvel, had become ensnared in an extramarital affair with a prostitute, a revelation that Ruth would refuse to forgive despite Marvel's best efforts to resolve their marriage. And Jack was therefore raised mainly by his mom, who, in order to distance the young Jack Parsons from his father, changed his name from Marvel to John. And then later, he finally took on the nickname Jack. Now, it's important to note that Jack Parsons grew up in a world that largely viewed the possibility of space travel as preposterous. But like many children of that time, he was fascinated by science fiction. It was the roaring 1920s, you know, a decade that has come to be known as the pulp era of entertainment. Alongside the exploding popularity of radio entertainment, the movie industry was burgeoning and things like entertainment journals and sci-fi magazines and various pulp literature were beginning to fill the magazine racks of common neighborhood stores, stirring the imaginations of everyday people with wild adventures about, you know, courageous spacemen traveling to distant planets where epic battles ensue against aliens and robots and everything in between. And while ideas like these may have made for great sci-fi stories, they weren't to be taken seriously by credible scientists at that time. But for a young Jack Parsons, this line between science and fiction wasn't so broad. He approached these topics with seriousness, you know, and viewed such things with a realistic sense of unrealized possibility. And he was particularly fascinated by stories of traveling to the moon, citing H.G. Wells' The First Men in the Moon among his greatest inspirations. It's speculated that it was his love for science fiction that sparked in him a passion for rocketry. In fact, by the age of 12, he was already practicing for his future career in rocket science, creating all sorts of explosive devices and leaving charred mounds of dirt and grass scattered throughout the yard of the Parsons family home. And it was also at this relatively innocent age of 12 that Jack Parsons claims to have conducted his first satanic ritual. It was an attempted invocation. Uh, his goal was to summon the devil into his own bedroom. It's a memory that he would later refer to as his, quote, magical fiasco. But you know, it's pretty scary stuff, especially for a 12 year old. And it was enough to frighten a young Jack Parsons into stepping away from such activities, at least for a while. Now, although he was very obviously intelligent, uh, Parsons performed poorly in school. He was dyslexic and he struggled with reading and writing, no doubt contributing to his unpopularity and perhaps even compelling this increasingly rebellious attitude and unruly behavior, which was becoming a problem. Uh, he was described in his youth to have been effeminate and socially awkward in his personality, which I'm sure offered little help in his efforts to fit in. But I think the truth is that high school served as a real culture shock and a reality check for Parsons. You know, being raised in the lap of wealth and luxury proved to be a handicap in terms of his ability to relate to his classmates, you know, with whom he had little in common. But for all his teenage struggles, he was fortunate enough to have a faithful friend by the name of Ed Foreman. And Foreman was the type of friend that could keep a guy like Jack safe. You know, he had a reputation for being able to hold his own in a fight. And Foreman was this regular world kid, you know, from a middle class family who, apart from being dyslexic himself, had little in common with Parsons. Ed was tall and handsome and street smart, whereas Jack was, you know, quite the opposite. A spoiled and eccentric rich kid with less than a masculine physique. You know, Ed was also two years older than Jack. But their lives crossed paths on the playground one day when a young Ed Foreman saw a crowd of kids gathered around a scuffle that had broken out. He approached the fight and saw that there was some kid on the ground getting kicked around by these bullies. And without warning, Ed Foreman cocked his fist back and just smashed it into one of their faces and splattered blood across his shirt, which caused the whole group to go running off. And laying on the ground below him was Jack Parsons, his dorky and bright colored sci-fi books scattered around him. And it just so happened that Ed was also a big fan of science fiction. So after helping Jack to his feet, they began talking sci-fi straight away and an instant friendship was formed. And I know that this sounds like a corny scene from a Hallmark movie, but it's how the story goes. And those that were close to them would define Ed Foreman as Jack's number one fan. He was just fascinated by everything that captivated Parsons, you know, from his rocket experiments to his interest in the occult and magic. 
And over time, Parsons would go on to share his knowledge of explosives with Ed, who took to it naturally. And the two would eventually become an inseparable team of young rocketeers, creating rockets and bombs in the backyard of the Parsons' home as often as they could with their limited supply of gunpowder. You know, they didn't know it then, but this relationship would thrive into adulthood, and this rocketry hobby of theirs would later become their profession. But for now, Ed and Jack were just two kids who were struggling in school. Now, in the midst of all this, Jack's mom was growing concerned about his academic performance, and so she decided to send him to the Brown Military Academy for Boys in San Diego. However, the school couldn't quell Jack's obsession with explosives and his propensity to cause trouble, and he was ultimately expelled from the academy for setting off explosives in the school toilets. Like, literally, he just blew up all the toilets in the bathroom. And when Jack returned to his previous school the following year, he had a newly acquired confidence about himself. No longer was he the unpopular geek that he was before. You know, he was now the kid that got kicked out of a military school for blowing up the bathroom. And let's be honest, you know, that's a pretty awesome accomplishment in the mind of a rebellious teenage boy. I mean, that, that's the stuff of legends. But meanwhile, his family's financial situation was changing rapidly. They were among those who were deeply affected by the stock market crash of 1929, which unfortunately occurred directly after Jack's grandfather passed away. You know, and his grandfather, of course, was the source of the family's wealth. And to make matters worse, he died right after the completion of the construction of this extravagant and expensive mansion that he was building, you know, which left Ruth and Jack with a giant and beautiful house to live in, but with much less income to cover its expenses. And despite Jack's newly upgraded social status, he was still struggling in school academically. And so by his own initiative, he transferred to the more expensive University Academy, and he even picked up a part-time job to help offset the cost of tuition. He began working for the Hercules Powder Company, a chemicals and munitions manufacturer, which was truly an ideal job for a young rocket enthusiast. And all setbacks aside, Parsons did manage to graduate high school on schedule in 1931, and he continued to work at Hercules, where he was getting a free education in chemistry and explosives, you know, and befriending and talking with coworkers or different departments, experimenting with the company's vast selection of various chemicals and explosive agents, and he didn't realize it, but this was the beginning of his rocketry career. Uh, but deep down, he still desired to be a real rocket scientist, but he understood that he would need some credentials to make a real profession of it. And so, in hopes of attaining a degree in chemistry and physics, he decided to enroll in the Pasadena Junior College, strategizing that if he could perform well enough, it could be used as leverage to gain entry to Berkeley or Stanford University. But this turned out to be a failed pursuit that would deplete even more of the Parsons' remaining inheritance, and he was later forced to drop out for a lack of funds. But Jack persisted. He continued to conduct his own independent research and experimentation, and once again, he would find himself setting off bombs in his backyard by the side of his best friend, Ed Foreman. And if we fast forward by four or five years, they would both finally become members of a legitimate rocket program, and soon Jack would come to be called a pioneer in the advancement of spaceflight, his lifelong ambition. But he was also on the verge of embarking down a wild and wicked spiritual path that would change the course of his life, and perhaps even history itself. The craters and mountains of our moon bear the names of giants of science, figures like Archimedes, Kepler, and Copernicus. There is also a crater honoring someone called Jack Parsons. So, after stepping away from his interests in sorcery and witchcraft during his youth, Jack evidently had a change of heart when he reached adulthood. And in 1939, a 25-year-old Parsons and his first wife Helen joined a secret society called the Agape Lodge, which was, in reality, the Pasadena, California chapter of a group known as the Ordo Templi Orientis, or the OTO, a satanic and mystical cult that was founded near the turn of the 20th century and popularized by none other than the Great Beast himself the self-described wickedest man in the world, uh, Alistair Crowley. And Jack was not merely a practitioner of Crowley's satanic religion of Thelema, but a true disciple. Climbing quickly through the ranks and expanding the cult's influence, he soon began a personal correspondence and eventual friendship with Alistair Crowley himself. Now Crowley, of course, was considered to be a spiritual leader and messianic figure by all Thelemites, but for Parsons, Crowley was also a mentor, and he openly regarded him as even a father figure, which is sort of sad in context with the complicated dynamics of his relationship to his actual dad. And like most disciples, he desired to become Crowley's successor as the wickedest man in the world. 
he wasn't content as just a mere student of Thelema. He wanted to advance it. And so he would set out to achieve new magical breakthroughs, you know, and often emulating the work of Crowley in his efforts. For example, whereas Crowley was known to address himself as the Great Beast 666 in his writings, Parsons would adopt the title Antichrist in similar fashion. But anyways, anyways, back to the plot, where Jack was now fully involved with the engagements of this Agape Lodge. And it didn't take long for Parsons to become one of Crowley's most effective American representatives for the OTO, spreading the cult's influence throughout California pretty significantly. And meanwhile, as he continued to delve deeper into this occult world that he was now a leader within, he was simultaneously advancing a budding career in rocket science. He was by this point involved in a legitimate rocket program. It was a small rocket club that was composed of sort of a ragtag assortment of students from Caltech or the California Institute of Technology, in addition to Jack and his childhood friend Ed Foreman, who at that time were no more than self-taught amateur rocket enthusiasts, you know? They weren't even enrolled in the school, so it's really crazy that they managed to even be involved in this group. Uh, but they did so through their mutual friend Frank Molina. He was an aeronautics graduate student that they previously met at a public event being held at the university. And when Parsons and Foreman's explained their experiments and their results with Molina, he was impressed and he took interest in joining them. And Molina had a lot to bring to the table because he had access to a wind tunnel and all the resources available through the university's GALSIT program. Uh, GALSIT, it stands for the Graduate Aerospace Laboratories of the California Institute of Technology. And so that'll come up again, so just remember that. And I think it's interesting enough to mention that Frank Molina would later have a son named Roger who would go on to become a renowned astrophysicist and a distinguished professor and serves on the advisory council of an institution called METI, which stands for Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And I will also mention that Roger Molina is married to a woman by the name of Christine Maxwell, who is the daughter of the powerful and infamous Robert Maxwell and the sister of Ghislaine Maxwell, you know, the pimp of Epstein Island. I just wanted to mention that because I have no idea whether this is of any practical significance, um, but history just never fails to reveal these long-standing relationships between the same old elite families that continue to influence world affairs. And so anyways, Molina set out to persuade his supervisor to allow Parsons and Foreman to join the school's rocket program. And Von Karman was equally impressed by the experience and technical knowledge of these two outsiders, and so he decided to allow for them to join the team. And it was an unprecedented move that, you know, really speaks to the level of talent and knowledge that Parsons and Foreman managed to acquire independently. And this partnership spurred the creation of the Caltech Rocket Research Program, a small rocket team that would later come to be called the Suicide Squad. And this team was led by none other than Theodore von Karman, the Gelsit director himself. And as another quick detour, I was surprised to learn that von Karman was known to speak openly about his shared heritage with the famous Talmudic scholar Rabbi Judah Lowe. Uh, this rabbi was a Jewish mystic who was the subject of a famous legend. It's said that through the use of magic and ritual, the rabbi created a living creature from clay that is known mythologically as a golem. And if you have kids, you might notice that the golem is really popular once again via video games like Minecraft or Pokemon. Uh, but the existence of this golem was believed to be real by many. It was described as a giant monster, perhaps eight feet tall, that was made of hardened clay and with glowing eyes. He is said to have achieved this on behalf of his mystical and esoteric knowledge of how God created Adam. You know, and of course, Adam from Genesis was also made from clay, and he is considered by the Jewish Talmud to be the first golem. And there's a whole adventure that ensues according to the legend, which I just don't have time to get into, but I do suggest a topic for your own continued research. And perhaps this famous rabbi's ancestry to von Karman is of no real significance, but it was certainly important to him. And so just keep this in mind as we examine the strange cast of characters that surrounded Jack Parsons in his short lifetime. Now, there are differing accounts of how this rocket club acquired its now famous name, the Suicide Squad. According to some sources, the nickname was coined by students around the campus and it was intended as an insult, you know, apparently due to the dangerous nature of their explosive experiments. And I read that Von Karman was embarrassed by the nickname and that he was also aware that some of his fellow faculty members were grumbling about the danger and commotion associated with his group, you know. And so he responded by moving the location of their test site to the furthest edge of the university's property. 
but other reliable sources have claimed that the guys in the group coined the name Suicide Squad themselves. Now, I suspect that both accounts are possibly true. If the nickname were attributed to them, you know, they probably liked the ring of it and adopted it officially because after all, it's a really cool name, you know? <laughs> Suicide Squad, it's awesome. And I suppose the origins of the club's name don't really matter, uh, but the perfectionist in me just can't allow for things like this to go unmentioned. Uh, but regardless, although the so-called Suicide Squad was initially regarded as an amateur outfit of thrill-seeking rocketeers, they eventually started developing some revolutionary stuff, game-changing advancements in rocketry. And one of these included something called JADO, which stands for Jet Assisted Takeoff. It was a technology that Parsons helped create and had caught the eye of the U.S. Army. A Navy privateer makes a jet assisted takeoff at the All-American Air Maneuvers at Miami, Florida. Now, whether or not you believe that there is any power in magic and witchcraft is up to you, but it goes without saying that Jack Parsons certainly did. And as this small team would go on to enjoy some great achievements in the following years, Parsons was never shy to attribute the group's success to his magic rituals and spell castings. And as the Suicide Squad pursued their historic mission of getting a rocket into space, it's fair to assume that Parsons experienced it all much differently than his peers. Guided by visions and voices and drug-enhanced dreams of space exploration and astral projection, this was all, to Parsons, a massive satanic ritual. But that's not to say that his fellow Rocketeers were unaware of Jack's occult obsession. They simply regarded him as unique and quirky. You know, and after all, the man was a clear genius, and everybody knows that such highly intelligent people can tend to be rather eccentric in personality. And so it went that Jack would continue pursuing both rocketry and magic zealously. It was in 1943 that the U.S. Army made their first purchase of a large order of JADO units from Galset. And with this funding came a more professional image for the group. Now called Aerojet Engineering, the small rocket team had established their presence as a serious contender in the high-stakes world of aerospace manufacturing. And that year, Jack Parsons would start to make a lot of money. And he was spending it just as quickly as he was making it. Where any office boy or young mechanic can be a panic with just a good looking pan. <laughs> Parsons quickly purchased a mansion in Pasadena, California that served not only as his home, but also as a sort of occult commune and arena for his drug and sex-infused rituals and over-the-top parties. He cleverly named his house The Parsonage, and it would soon become the headquarters for his Thelema-based cult gatherings. And allegedly, neighbors would sometimes complain about things like late-night costume parties or loud live music and open drug consumption and even naked women jumping through rings of fires, you know, that sort of thing. Yet seemingly unaffected by all the chaos and debauchery that he immersed himself into by night, Parsons would continue showing up to work the following day and proceed to excel in his pursuits and make significant advancements in the field. And as I stated previously, his occult practices were no secret. You know, his peers and co-workers were well aware of such activities, as were his employers, the United States Army. But at the end of the day, his genius was really a valuable asset to the team. And so Parsons was sort of living above the law at this time enjoying an unspoken level of protection from the government due to a mutual interest in his research. And this was no doubt a very convenient arrangement in regard to the controversial activities taking place inside the parsonage. You know, and this increase to Jack's financial status enabled him to invest more heavily into these occult projects. And soon the parsonage was a bona fide headquarters for the local OTO cult. And back at work, now that Parsons and his fellow founders of Aerojet had secured this enormous government contract, they created the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. Choosing to use the words jet propulsion and to avoid the word rocket because at that time, people associated rockets with outdated wartime weapons, and also because of its shared connotations with science fiction. And so it was decided that the term jet propulsion sounded more scientifically credible and would be taken more seriously as a technology. Now, today, JPL is sometimes jokingly referred to as Jack Parsons Laboratory, with many believing that his initials are included in the name by intention. But his time with JPL didn't last long, because despite being in good standing with most of his team, Parsons' public reputation as a Satan-worshipping, Crowley-loving party animal eventually became a burden and embarrassment to the growing company, which was by this point directly affiliated with the U.S. government. <laughs> 
And he was aware that he was losing favor with his superiors. So in 1944, he accepted a proposition to leave JPL in exchange for his share of the company, which amounted to about $11,000 in severance pay. And keep in mind that this was in the 1940s. So this payout was the equivalent of almost $200,000 today. Now, years later in 1957, the Soviet Union would allegedly go on to achieve the impossible as they launched Sputnik 1, which is considered to be the first artificial satellite to be successfully placed in orbit. Now, if you were paying attention over the previous chapter of this documentary series, then you should know that I have my doubts about this type of thing. But for the sake of the story, the launch of Sputnik 1 was a giant milestone in the historic space race between the Soviet Union and the United States. And it was an embarrassment to the American space program, which needed to prove that it was also capable of such a feat. And after a spectacularly failed attempt by the U.S. Navy, the government turned to none other than Jack Parsons Laboratory, or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to be more accurate. And this led to the famous launch of the Explorer, and the rest is history. NASA's website explains it this way. With Explorer 1, JPL vaulted the U.S. into space and prompted the formation of NASA. On December 3, 1958, only two months after NASA started operations, JPL was transferred from Army jurisdiction to that of the new Civilian Space Agency. I will add that JPL is NASA's only federally funded research and development center and is regarded as the leading force in space exploration, supposedly sending robots and rovers to Mars, you know, and that sort of thing. You could say that JPL is the tip of the spear for the American space program, and it was only possible through the invention of Jack Parsons' rocket fuel, which has cemented his place among the forefathers of NASA. However, after leaving JPL in 1944, and with a freshly cleared schedule, Jack decided to use his remaining wealth to jump entirely into his occult ambitions. He was, after all, still deeply entrenched in the operations of his Agape Lodge cult. He began renting out rooms in the parsonage, and imposed a pretty unusual criteria for potential renters. Essentially, that they must be fellow occultists and eccentric hedonists like himself. And I know that probably seems like an exaggeration, but he actually published an ad in the local Pasadena newspaper that said, only bohemians, artists, musicians, atheists, anarchists, or other exotic types need apply for rooms. Any mundane soul would be ceremoniously rejected. And the Parsonage became the host to a number of notable figures, such as author and screenwriter Ray Bradbury and Forrest J. Ackerman and many others. But for all the interesting people that would come and go from the Parsonage, none were more impactful to Jack Parsons and his cult than the young L. Ron Hubbard would soon become. Hubbard was already a successful science fiction writer, but his true fame would come after he created and established the Church of Scientology. The Minister of Health for the United Kingdom said in Parliament in 1968, I quote, The government are satisfied, having reviewed all the available evidence, that Scientology is socially harmful. Hubbard first met Jack Parsons in 1945 when visiting the Agape Lodge. Parsons was impressed with his charisma and intelligence, and the two quickly became friends, bonding over their shared interest in the occult and science fiction. And it was also around this time that Jack had decided to divorce his wife Helen, who had become impregnated by a fellow member of the Lodge. You know, I'm sure that was a common inconvenience in sex cults. Um, but anyways, don't feel too bad for him because Jack had already been pursuing a romantic relationship with her younger sister, Sarah. So after divorcing Helen, he had her sister, Sarah, move into the parsonage with him. Um, but the problem was that Jack's other new roommate, the young L. Ron Hubbard, also had eyes for Sarah. And of course, this conundrum was only exacerbated by the fact that they were all engaging in sex magic rituals together. And according to some biographers, Parsons began to grow suspicious of a seemingly brewing relationship between his wife and Hubbard. However, Jack and Sarah would remain married, and a short while later, Parsons and Hubbard would decide to collaborate together in an elaborate and complex ritual, the Babylon Working, inspired by Crowley's religion of Thelema and his 1917 novel titled Moonchild. And there were many things that Parsons hoped to accomplish through the Babylon working, but the ultimate goal was to evoke the manifestation of a magical entity known as the Scarlet Woman of Babylon. And for those of you who are listening to this and can't read the screen, Babylon was intentionally misspelled by Parsons and Hubbard for complex reasons that I don't care to indulge. But Christians should recognize that the imagery of a Scarlet Woman of Babylon is a direct reference to the so-called Whore of Babylon in the Book of Revelations. And you gotta understand that the expected results of these rituals are always sort of ambiguous and cryptic. Parsons and Hubbard believed that this entity would help them to achieve spiritual enlightenment and to initiate the Age of Horus, as prophesied by Aleister Crowley. 
Some sources say that Jack's motivation to manifest the Scarlet Woman was to actually have her as a partner in order to birth the Moon Child, as referenced in Crowley's book of the same title. And so the Babylon working ritual began in January of 1946, and it drew upon a variety of occult traditions, including sexual magic, invocation of spirits, and other demonic and mystical practices. And for the sake of decency, I will not go into detail about the perverse behaviors that these weirdos were engaging in, uh, all I'm going to say is that it included a lot of gross and X-rated interaction between these two highly esteemed men of history. And they continued to practice the ritual over the course of the next few weeks, but things turned sour when it was revealed that Hubbard had been engaged in a secret affair with Jack's wife Sarah all along. But as I mentioned previously, members of the Agape Lodge were also engaging in sex magic rituals with one another, you know, and they slept around regularly, so I'm not really sure that their marriage ever counted in the first place. And besides, by this time, Jack himself was already engaged in an affair of his own with a woman by the name of Marjorie Cameron, a talented artist and poet and fellow occultist who was equally as charismatic as Jack. They met shortly after his first attempt at the Babylon working ritual when she had come to visit the parsonage in January of 1946. And it was reportedly love at first sight between these two. For Jack, it was actually more of a matter of destiny. Um, he considered Cameron's recent and unexpected arrival to be a result of his rituals. You know, he thought that she could be the Scarlet Woman. And if you recall from my description of the Babylon working, the next step after you evoke the Scarlet Woman is to conceive the Moon Child. And so they got to work right away. According to the book Sex and Rockets by John Carter, Jack and Cameron would spend two consecutive weeks locked away in his bedroom at the parsonage shortly after meeting. And this is pretty gross to visualize, but as the two were doing the deed, L. Ron Hubbard reportedly towered above them while chanting rites and incantations in an unsuccessful effort to evoke the moon child in Cameron's womb. And when Parsons and Cameron finally left the bedroom, they would continue a passionate relationship that was characterized not only by their infatuation with each other, but also by their shared interests in magic and the occult. And they would continue various rituals to achieve the conception of this moon child, uh, but without success. And anyways, despite the preoccupations of the various affairs that ensnared the entire group, Jack and Hubbard would continue to progress the Babylon working. That is, until Hubbard disappeared one day, abandoning the working to ride off into the sunset with Jack's wife Sarah at his side. And by the way, this is a great example of why open relationships are pointless. Uh, but here's the kicker, as if stealing his best friend's girl wasn't bad enough, Hubbard also robbed Parsons blind and took all his money after he received a large loan towards an investment that Jack shared with him in good faith, only to be ripped off when Hubbard disappeared and never repaid his loan, which left Parsons with a significant debt and beginning a cycle of financial struggles that would remain until his death. In a letter that Parsons would later write to Aleister Crowley, he would describe the founding Scientologist as a confidence man and a thoroughly dishonest and insincere individual. And he may have been disappointed by this betrayal from his wife and former best friend, uh, but both were easily replaced by his new girl, Marjorie, who preferred to be called by her last name, Cameron, by the way. Uh, he considered Cameron to be spiritually superior to everybody else. Uh, she was a fellow Thelemite, and in Jack's mind, her very presence was the manifestation of his own magic. And now, as a couple, the two began working together towards their magical goal of ushering in the Aeon of Horus, you know, just like every other disciple of Crowley. And she was kind of like his new and prettier version of L. Ron Hubbard. You know, they would conduct satanic rituals together and engage in all types of weird sex magic in accordance with Crowley's proclaimed great work. You know, and they were trying to achieve what Thelemites refer to as the true will. But despite their best efforts, these rituals didn't seem to be working out that well for them. And in the years that followed, Jack and Cameron's relationship would deteriorate into an on-again, off-again type thing, and Parsons would begin to acquire significant debt. And so he started taking on different small jobs and receiving loans from friends to get by. And eventually, he and Cameron started doing some work in Hollywood with some of their culty friends in the entertainment industry. Uh, Jack's expertise with explosions had some real value in the world of special effects and pyrotechnics, and so he would work in the movie studio by day and in a gas station by night. And although this was certainly a far cry from the prestigious conditions that he was accustomed to, it was a fitting routine for his lifestyle. And then Cameron would go on to actually star in a few movies, including Kenneth Anger's cult classic, The Inauguration of the Pleasure Dome, in which she played the role of, well, the Scarlet Woman. 
And many scenes from this famous movie were actually shot at the Parsonage, with Parsons himself working as a special effects consultant for the film. I knew a wonderful woman who appears in my film as the Scarlet Woman in uh, inauguration of the Pleasure Dome. Her name was Marjorie Cameron, but as an artist, she just used the name Cameron. And uh, she was the widow of Jack Parsons, who was the adopted son of Aleister Crowley. And Parsons, he was a scientist as well as an occultist, which is a very uh, strange but compelling uh, combination. And he had um, invented the fuel that took the uh, rocket to the moon. That was Jack Parsons' contribution. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And through it all, Parsons would remain active in his various pursuits of magic and sorcery until his mysterious death by explosion in 1952. Upon hearing the news of his death, his mother Ruth would sadly overdose on pills and die by suicide merely hours after the passing of her son. And just like everything else in his lifetime, even Parsons' death continues to be a matter of conspiracy theory and suspicion. The official story is that he died by accidental suicide, you know, a simple mistake of mishandling explosive chemicals. However, many people believe that he was actually murdered. And this presents an entirely new rabbit hole and deep dive, which I just refuse to explore for the sake of time. And the same could be said about many other topics that came up in my research of Jack Parsons that I chose to bypass, including things like spiritual apparitions being summoned in the presence of attendees at the Parsonage, or that he worked for Howard Hughes for a period of time and reportedly stole materials from Hughes Aviation, which resulted in an FBI investigation that targeted Parsons with the charge of espionage. You know, and then of course there was a time that Jack either created or attempted to create a homunculus, a magical yet physical creature that requires a relatively disgusting ritual to accomplish and rings back to that famous Golem of Prague story that we went over earlier. So believe me, there is no shortage of absurd and unbelievable claims that you're going to find in regard to the life of Jack Parsons if you choose to research it further. But this is where I'm going to draw the line. And this is also where most documentaries on the topic would end, with Parsons being the sole example of a loose connection between space flight and the occult. However, this is where our story truly begins. In Washington, ghost-like objects dart across the radar screen at the CAA Traffic Control Center at National Airport for several hours, traveling more than 100 miles an hour. Air Force jet fighters spend several hours chasing the objects plotted on the radar scope. On July 19th and 20th of 1952, radar operators at Washington National Airport detected a number of unknown objects moving at high speeds and making sudden changes in direction. Pilots in the area also reported seeing strange lights and objects in the sky. These sightings caused a flurry of media attention and sparked government investigations, including a top secret study conducted by the U.S. Air Force called Project Blue Book. More on that later. This historic UFO event sent shockwaves through the country and really captured the imaginations of the people. This was at a time in history when science fiction was really exploding into the culture, and this concept of aliens visiting us from outer space was becoming exponentially more popular. And keep in mind that this was only a few years after the famous Kenneth Arnold sighting and the infamous Roswell event, both of which occurred in 1947. And as the whole country marveled at these unidentified objects in the sky, for Cameron and some of the remaining members of the Agape Lodge, they perceived it to be related to the death of their former leader, Jack Parsons. You know, perhaps this was evidence that his Babylon working and that their efforts to bring about a new era of spiritual transformation were having an impact on the world. But Jack's former OTO companions were not the only ones to draw connections between the ritual workings of Jack Parsons and this sudden emergence of high-profile UFO sightings. Actually, several of his occult contemporaries have suggested that Parsons may have neglected to properly conclude the Babylon working rituals, uh, perhaps failing to seal the magical gateway that he claimed to have opened, and thereby implying that these UFOs and interdimensional aliens could be freely passing through the spiritual portal left behind by Parsons and Hubbard, you know, somewhere in the Mojave Desert. And although it's a pretty radical idea, the theory was not confined only to the occult community. 
according to some sources, this possibility was actually taken seriously by a small faction of people from within the U.S. government.